Well, I, let me just uh, waste a few minutes to say that I feel privileged to have been asked to come to Thailand and uh, to be part of this uh, series of lectures, hopefully uh, directed toward increasing understanding and peaceful coexistence. I, uh, I have given three different lectures. Uh, one has to do, had to do with uh, strictly astronomy, uh, in which I was trying to get across the point of view that scientific study of nature is in itself beautiful and exciting. The second uh, uh, topic has been the relationship between basic and uh, applied research. And uh, I discussed that this morning at the Asian uh, Technology Institute. And the third one, uh, which I've been asked to, to do, is uh, today's uh, the realization of a large research project, the condition for realization of large ex um, research enterprises. I, I feel there is a common theme. I don't feel that I have a split personalities here. I have, feel there is a common theme throughout this. That is a, a certain belief in the capacity of free minds to comprehend nature and uh, through knowledge to improve the general welfare. Uh, I should also, before I get into uh, things, uh, um, slightly object to the title of my uh, uh, you know, brief remarks. That is that um, I have worked with NASA funding for uh, essentially all my scientific life. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that I approve of uh, NASA style of management or of some of the objective that it set for itself. Uh, in particular, I share some of the concerns having to do with uh, uh, difficulties in uh, focusing on regional projects in the manned area, although I believe in manned exploration of space, I don't think that uh, uh, some of the approaches that NASA has followed have been very, uh, very rewarding. So uh, once I, I lay that aside, what I will uh, draw upon will be my experience in working, yes, with NASA, uh, in building a number of spacecrafts and also in operating them. And then uh, uh, the experience with uh, ESO, the European Southern Observatory, in constructing fairly large ground-based facilities, like the very large telescope. It's the largest optical array in the world today. And uh, in the uh, enterprise, which is now called ALMA, which is ongoing and which is a joint program between the United States, uh, ESO, and uh, Japan. And uh, this particular program is different from the others in that it, uh, no one country is, has taken the lead. It is truly a joint partnership, which is uh, a new experience for the United States. Um, and uh, uh, the, which I think will be the norm in the future for very large scientific enterprises which become large enough that essentially they become world enterprises because nobody can afford it, not even the United States can afford to do it alone. And we have some examples of those like ITER, that is the fusion program, and the difficulties exist in uh, coming to an understanding and cooperative uh, agreement on those. So this is my experience, this is the basis on which I will talk. Uh, so I, I, I thought I would just spend a few minutes uh, of introductions. Okay, the first thing is what is a large program? So I have a definition of large program. It's a program that lasts more than five years. Uh, this is all approximate, I mean, of course. That costs more than $100 million. And that is, uh, requires a staff of more than 200. So that I would call it a, a large program by definition. Now, typical are the ones I listed, Hubble, Chandra, Alma, and VLT. Each one costed approximately a billion dollars, approximately took 10 years, and had a staff of about 1,000 uh, involved. Uh, and uh, you know, the last remark is that uh, to, 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 to refer it to something that we know from history is cathedrals require the same amount of effort. Uh, 100 people, 100 years, typically, uh, that's uh, 10 to the fourth man years, and I put in temple to, to, to uh, 
cater to your uh, uh, approaches, rather you don't build cathedrals, you build temples, but it, 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 presumably it's the same. Um, so that's the programs we are talking about. Now, the way I will discuss in, in, in the way I'm introducing how to carry out this program is somewhat ideally, idealized plan, which assumes that effectiveness in carrying out the program and achieving the goals that one set oneself is the primary consideration. Now, most of the time, that's not true in the real world. That is, there is politics that comes involved. There is institutional interest. Uh, for instance, NASA very often tries to maintain its institutions, which are placed in different states of the Union, and in which the senators of those states uh, become very influential lobbies to maintain some flow of money in their own particular institution. Uh, sociological uh, uh, requirement, that is, uh, for instance, giving uh, jobs to uh, uh, minorities. Uh, social law, uh, education requirements, uh, trying to do things in such a way that they result in educational uh, benefits. Now, I have disregarded all of that, and I consider those, I'm not saying they shouldn't be there, I'm saying that I consider them as overhead or, or uh, uh, loss, I put them in the loss column, so to speak, not from the sociological point of view, they should be in the plus column, but from the point of view of realizing the project, on strictly technical grounds are cost, are additional costs that you must pay. So that's number one. Number two, the program. Uh, I think a program requires a long-term vision of what you're trying to do. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, we, we have, uh, for instance, again, using NASA as a bad example, uh, setting up the space station with ever having, without having a clear idea of what it was going to be used for was a mistake. Uh, a vision like uh, President Bush put forward today that he wants to go to Mars is a good vision in the sense that it gives you a long-term uh, idea of what you should try to do, what you should maximize as you achieve intermediate goals. So you need a long-term vision that is beyond the horizon, the fiscal horizon, and then you need immediate goals or goals which are within the fiscal horizon, five years or whatever the, the uh, uh, budgetary plan is. You need a management structure, and you have to be very clear at the ons onset who is in charge, I mean, or how you're going to manage this project. You need to assess critical technology that will make or break the project. Are there things that you must know without which the project will fail? How much staff you will need? Physical resources, laboratories, whatever. Time, how much time, what is your time horizon? And the financial resources. And all of these should be integrated in a plan in which you have certain results. <coughs> that is, you will find out what is the necessary research and technological development you need in order to carry out this project. What are the staff numbers? Is this a feasible thing? I mean, can you hire all of the people that you claim you're going to hire in the time you have available? Are there skills that, etc.? Real estate and equipment needs, that's obvious. Cash flow, which is a real problem normally because uh, isolated programs tend to have a non-flat distribution. You tend to build up for a while uh, during design and development, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have uh, a realization that is you start cutting metal and start implementing things or designing software. And that typically comes up with a peak in expenditure, which uh, it doesn't have to be uh, done that way, but it's the most effective way in which you can spend the money. Uh, if you are forced to uh, a, a, a slower cash flow, uh, then you will have increased cost. And, and this is something that is difficult for funding agencies to, to, to respond to from time to time. And then finally, time, with a clear understanding that time and all of the other things are closely associated with each other. Now, uh, this one the one? No, this is the one. Okay. Then conditions. I mean, you can't, okay, so, you need these things. Now, the condition is there must be political support 
And by that I mean, uh, again, going to, uh, to using some of the NASA experience, that um, right now uh, there is tremendous uh, su su political support, meaning there is support by people and their representative in Congress to continue the scientific exploration of space. But there is a tremendous uncertainty about continuing with the shuttle program, which has caused at least uh, two major fatalities, and which seems to be not terribly focused. It has not delivered the great promises that were made or, or by having lots of capability of transportation in space, utilization of space station, large overruns have occurred, and NASA has lost a lot of credit on this. Uh, and so it's difficult to build political support for ESA for this new venture which the president has um, uh, uh, decided upon. The support uh, here is the support must be based on promises and achievable results. Uh, to give the impression that in zero gravity uh, one would do uh, biological research which could be important to cure cancer was a terrible idea. I mean, to give the impression to people. So this is what I would call, it's an overpromise. It's, uh, it's uh, marketing gone mad. And uh, I think that uh, scientists should not be involved in such a thing. They should try to keep a sober, um, feasible goals to research. And I think they should, uh, 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 based in the position in which uh, they would be forced to lie to keep their job, they should resign. That would be my. So it's very important that you have a university affiliations with tenure so that you can resign and uh, still have a living. Okay. I, I actually succeeded in having that uh, throughout my career. Then. Uh, the technical people should not accept tasks which are patently unfeasible. It's the same statement saying uh, we owe to our government's honesty in saying, no, this is, this, you know, it, it, this is ridiculous. I mean, uh, an example, clear example of Star Wars, which was something that every physicist in the world knew wouldn't work and in which billions were expended by both sides, by the way. And, and when I talked to uh, Soviet scientists, they said, but you know it doesn't work. And he said, yes, but my government thinks that since the Americans are spending the money, then, uh, you know. <laughs> and this is crazy. I mean, this is, uh, okay. Technical people should not, uh, should be absolutely truthful to the best of their knowledge and ability. Okay, these are not just Pio's remarks that I make. I am saying that these are fundamental conditions for success because you can show that when this kind of a approach has not been followed, the consequences have been very, very severe. Loss of confidence in, uh, in, uh, in the organizations that carry out this project and very great difficulty in convincing people that you know what you're doing and, 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 and you're worthy of being supported. Okay. Organization of the program. Uh, when you have programs which are fairly large, you need to manage them. Management is not just a terrible, I mean, uh, one of the problems I have with, with some of my colleagues, particularly in academia, is that they don't believe in management. They think management is something just to keep the inspector general happy that uh, you, you, it isn't. It isn't uh, so at all. Management is a requirement in which particularly if you're doing very high technology content jobs, you cannot direct from above. You must have the creative, willing, uh, intellectually honest contribution from the people in the staff. And this cannot be done except with very good communications. So the job of a manager is to transfer to the old staff knowledge of what the vision is, or what are we trying to do here? What are, why are you coming to work every day except for making a salary? Uh, you are here to do something that we can do only together. 
Well, then you break down the work because there is so much to do that nobody can possibly do everything oneself, right? <coughs> but you must make sure that you give somebody both the responsibility and authority to carry it out. And the work breakdown structure, which is a common term which is being used, is simply that statement that you are breaking down the work in units that will be managed at some level. You need a management information system to monitor progress, self-monitoring, uh, progress versus time and expenditure. You need critical path analysis. What is the thing that will stop you if it, something stops you? The communication, both vertical and horizontal, are obviously essential in this case. And I mean that both vertically up and down and horizontal. It's very important that some group which is doing something which apparently is not related to what some other group is doing know what is going on. Much of the problems that have occurred, for instance, in large organizational structure, have to do with uh, one group assumes that the other group is doing something which the other group is not doing at all. So in part of the safety issues, safety inspections and so forth, there was no clarity of communication among groups and there was no clarity of communication up and down. Now, this is my personal belief, flat pyramid. Um, if you have a very highly technical job, there shouldn't be too much, uh, um, too many levels between the top management and the staff. And this is because every level adds a complication in communications. Because you, now you must have lower level managers uh, who are not only responsible for the technical conduct of the job, which normally they're qualified to do, but also have the qualities, the human qualities which are required for communication, which is very much more difficult for technical people to have. It requires particular training. So these uh, numbers that I have uh, put down, if you wish, are as follows. Uh, any person can only have seven people reporting to him before he lose track of what they are doing. So 70, seven to the M defines the number of levels you have to have for an organization of a given size. So as an example, of course, when you work alone in seven to the zero, you're perfectly uh, communicating and everything. Uh, then you can have, uh, for eight people, it's uh, seven to the first, 49 is seven to square, but, but the important point is that even only seven to the fourth is already 2,500 people, roughly speaking. Now that would mean that you should be able to manage 2,500 people with only four levels of jerarchical levels. And everything else is an overconstruct. Okay? Now that's hard to take to many, um, particularly bureaucratic organization. I mean, you're eliminating a lot of jobs. And, uh, yet, for very highly technical enterprises, which don't require a lot of manufacturing and so forth. Manufacturing may be a different story. Uh, but for research enterprises, I think that this is valid, this, this kind of approach. Now, meritocracy, I mean, that goes without saying, um, but it's very important. That is, uh, if people are assigned uh, tasks on the basis that they are cousins of somebody, uh, then, uh, then that will fail. I mean, uh, then, then it becomes very difficult because uh, you have to find ways to work around them. And, and uh, one of the problems that occurs when you work with a government organization or government funded uh, project is that uh, sometimes people are placed in position of super, supervisory position with respect to technical people and they are not competent technically. That makes for a very awkward situation because this is the person that presumably manages you but he doesn't know what he's doing. And you must do the work for him without getting him too upset. <coughs> and uh, it, it's tricky. 
So meritocracy is very important. That is, uh, and, and let me just make clear what I mean because I, I think it's important. As director of Space Telescope Science Institute, I, had, I hired from private industry a large number of people who were working as industrial workers under our direction, the direction of the staff of this institute. However, many of them were actually scientists and the policy we followed, it didn't matter where somebody was coming from if he knew he would lead so that we had staff people of the institute reporting to these industrial contractors because they were more competent than we were. Now, for the government, for government organization, this is something that they cannot, they're afraid of. Um, and NASA has never done it. So you have, okay, there is a superstructure there where they use a lot of uh, private company employees, but they always manage by a, by a, uh, government person. And we eliminated even that. Okay? So, so, and that worked out very, very well. Okay, finally and last best practice. Now, again, a statement that, uh, I mean, be successful, working and getting the job done within the cost that's uh, done fast is not the only objective that the government or the funding agency or whatever may have in mind. They may have in mind to, to have these other sociological uh, good results. So this is best practice if you want to achieve a specific research goal without any other consideration in mind. Uh, okay? And I would say that these uh, have worked. That these, what I'm trying to say is that this is not just theory. It's uh, something that has worked out. Oh, oh, I, I, I did something wrong. Okay. So the first issue is, uh, 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 thank you. <laughs> Slide five, right, that's it. Okay. So no delays allowed. Well, this is, if you wish, is a philosophical, well, it's a practically philosophical point. Any delay costs you money. So if you have a program and you start delaying it, two things can happen. One is you actually will never end. Uh, there's been a program in uh, space physics, which is GPB, Gravitational Probe B, that went for 40 years and had an overrun of a factor of 20. I believe, was supposed to cost 30 million, it ended up costing 700 million, and was delayed for so long that it's not obvious today that it's worth doing it scientifically anymore, okay? It might be, but, and that was justified on the basis that scientists would take the high moral ground and say, well, we will not be pushed to do things fast because then we may do them wrong. Well, that that's, to me is unacceptable, meaning that, okay, why don't you figure out how to do it some other way that will allow you to do it in time, or why don't you decrease your ambitions if you can't do it within, okay. No overrun allowed, that is you should stay within the cost. Now we found, we found methods to to uh, actually implement this by doing the following. We would have um, contingencies. And the scientists were, were informed that if we had to spend the contingency because there was a problem coming up, fine, we would. But if they could save the contingency and do the job without expanding the contingency, the contingency would then be used to do additional research. So it was like a profit that we would make by working very effectively, we would then turn this, this effectiveness in doing more research. And since we are always, you know, fund bound, that was a tremendous incentive for people, personally, to, to have an incentive to do work effectively, which otherwise does not exist. Hiding of problems is deadly, and I don't want to 
to, I mean, because uh, then uh, you, you find out late, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Frequent reporting and reviews from the outside. Uh, monthly reporting, I think, uh, at, at least. Uh, which also give an opportunity to talk to each other, which is not entirely, you know, left to random uh, chance that uh, a supervisor actually talks to his people. And in the same sense, suitable annual personal evaluation for recruitment and replacement policies. Notice replacement, by the way. And, and this was uh, put in with evil intent uh, so that uh, the freedom to after a, a while to perhaps let go somebody who is not productive and so forth is important as well. Uh, and to tie the evaluation to the goals that you have established through the work breakdown system. That is, these are not evaluation of in, in, in uh, abstract, they are evaluation based on the fact that the person has been given a responsibility, he has been given, the he or she has been given the job to do it, did he do it or did he not? And the evaluation is based on that. There may be other criteria that you can add, but with respect to the programmatic issue, that should be a fact. So, uh, this is, I think, is the sum total of my experience uh, that I can offer, and I, I would, turn it over to you and do whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Giacconi. And uh, I would like to turn, actually, the, the, the functions of moderator to Dr. Sakharin Pumirat, uh, the Director of National Science and Technology Development Agency, so I can drop down my ad hoc functions here at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> oh, thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you again, to, uh, Professor Giacconi, and uh, with uh, respect to uh, Professor Sipanon uh, Getutat, who kindly uh, come to share his experience, also to ask questions, and, and also as well as sharing his experience. Uh, I'd like to, uh, as, as the President of NASDA, welcome all of you here. And, and thank you, uh, our honorable guest again. And uh, since this is a very informal uh, roundtable discussion, and, and NECTEC has uh, uh, put forward the uh, the uh, titles of a uh, mega, mega science project, uh, to me, as administrator, as uh, the Honorable Professor has mentioned a few times, uh, we in Thailand has been, has been uh, grappled with the questions of whether to have a good mega science project or science mega project as a tool for s and development in the country. I suppose we never did agree on having a good real good one as, as, as a, 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 a track or, or a, a flag for, for the rest of the country to follow. Whether that is an advisable decision or whether that's a good decision, I think uh, remains to be, to be uh, discussed. Uh, I, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons behind that. But uh, uh, so what, what I'm saying is that there are several ways you can look at this, uh, this uh, discussion today, and I'm sure we are open to, to look at it from, from all sides. I think the uh, question is whether we should have it, whether it's a good idea, whether it's, uh, it's a must-have, uh, is, is open to, to debate. And also, of course, uh, we would like to, to tap on your your uh, experience on, on running one uh, uh, since you, uh, you've been involved with several. So, so with that, I, 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 I again, uh, uh, as was mentioned, this is a very informal uh, discussions and, and therefore either post questions or, or provide your ideas. And I, I suggest that we have three seats up here. 
uh, anybody who wants to, to come join us, please please do come up. You may have to give up seat when, when for, if, if Kun Paron show up or something, but that's, uh, but do welcome to, to, to come up. So any, is that four seats? Do, please, please come up and, and, and join us. So, Ajahn uh, Sipanon, please. Okay. Uh, th uh, thank you, Professor Giacconi, for your uh, the enlightening presentation of your experience in managing mega projects. L let me uh, seek your advice or your experience on two related issues, uh, quite macro. Uh, one is uh, the mega project could be focused or more or less non-focused. For, for example, the focus project might be, uh, was to put man on the moon in 10 years. That's really focused. And uh, non-project may be to build science park in Thailand within five or 10 years, like this one. Now, the focused project and the non-focused projects. The non-focus is tougher to raise money, to convince politicians, uh, because we cannot deliver uh, research results to the public in reasonable time. Okay. Now, related to this, either, uh, in either case, focused or non-focused, in developmental phase, you need types of people, types of management and organization. And in the operational phase, another type of people and management. How do you cope with two related issues? I, I have a few examples in Thailand that I faced. Example that I faced in Thailand. Uh, 21, 22 years ago, I was charged with building up the first petrochemical complex in Thailand, in the eastern seaboard. It's not even a green field, it's a brown field. Mm -hmm. I had to fight with the uh, local mafia one day. Another day I had to discuss with top bankers in New York and in Germany. Uh, the, in, that was the largest project in Thailand ever taken at that time, one billion dollars and I was charged with to finish it in four years. And that's a tough one. I almost went crazy. Anyhow, and uh, to do that in the developmental phase, uh, th that is easier than uh, what, what you have uh, said, uh, Hubble space, etc. because technology, uh, whereas for me, uh, petrochemicals, people know techno yes. petrochemicals, even though I had to choose uh, uh, several uh, uh, technologies, which is the best one for Thailand for, for that particular feedstock, etc. Anyhow, uh, it was tough in that in the developmental phase, we need type of people, types of management. In the operational phase, we need another. And you cannot fire them, uh, fire people after you hire them, etc. What's your experience? Focused, uh, non focused, I, as I well guess as. I yeah. don't agree that uh, the uh, people who build and operate are different. In fact, um, in space telescope operation, there was a lot of something that went beyond operation, which had to do with the overall conduct of the program. Um, let me give you an example. We decided that uh, it would be important to have an archive to uh, distribute data all over the world and make it available to everybody. Now at the time, uh, there were no uh, convenient storage methods. Uh, uh, there were uh, these discs, there were 12 inch platters, very inconvenient and so forth. Today there are CDs uh, that are carry a lot of, so we actually developed in conjunction with, uh, with um, industry a whole new, brand new, uh, random access archive, which uh, was used then up to date, except it, uh, of course, it evolved, etc. Now, the people who actually developed that were astronomers, and uh, who, because they truly understood the needs of the field, 
of what would be needed in operations. And uh, we didn't have the money to do it, actually, so we did it in collaboration with Canadian astronomers and European astronomers who were left with the experience of having developed an archival system, which then they could use for their own benefit, and which then was applied for other programs. So it, it was a continuity. I think the ideal situation from the point of view of research scientists would be that you build a facility and you start operating that while you are designing the next one. And the, the, the two things are very interactive to each other. That's okay. But going back to the, the previous point, which I thought you were making, which is really very hard work. I agree with you that it's much easier to have a focused program because it's, it's a, you become a monomaniac, right? I mean, it's uh, very easy. Creating a, a science park is much harder, particularly if you intend to impose research directions from above. In fact, if you do that too much, I would say you are bound to fail because I would think that a, Creating a research park in which you give opportunity to people who come up with ideas to get funding and support to carry out their ideas, that seems to me healthy. But if it is an instrument for government control in the direction of research, that would be very dangerous. That, that, that would be my... So to do that, uh, you, you need, uh, I think, for a focus program, you need tight reins for a... a widespread advance, you need more loose control. That, that would be my, and that's hard. That's his job. <laughs> <laughs> that's very hard. I mean, that's, uh, so I didn't want, I, I don't want that kind of job. <laughs> I prefer that. Dr. Uh, uh, I would like to raise or ask several questions uh, about uh, how to manage a uh, makeup project, uh, looking from your experience and maybe from your knowledge. For example, in the comparison between the US style and the Russian style, do you think uh, uh, for the success case, the methodologies are more or less similar or there are some differences. I mean, uh, in Thailand, we are uh, in need of good uh, examples of uh, success uh, uh, methodologies. We have uh, American examples. We have Oriental examples. We have uh, European examples. What would be your uh, comments uh, uh, on this? Uh, comparisons, uh, aspects, to manage a big project? Well, I, I will try to restrict my comments to space endeavors, because that's where I have the biggest experience. I think one of the most um, effective institutions that I know of was ISAS, uh, Japanese um, space uh, research agency, but it was separate from the main uh, Japanese program. It was uh, under the control of the University of Tokyo. The scientists had responsibility for the funding, for carrying out the research, etc., etc. I, I, I knew them all. Uh, I knew the director, Minoru Oda, and he adopted the very best of the American, if you wish, inspiration, namely to give the responsibility to young people and so forth. And there was tremendous drive and, uh, and enthusiasm. I think the uh, Russian program has had some uh, tremendous achievement. Uh, for instance, I think they were absolutely right in their approach to uh, man exploration of dividing the man carrier from the uh, cargo carrier. In fact, they are furnishing the space station right now because of the, so the shuttle concept was wrong. Uh, on the other hand, uh, their technology is reasonably primitive. I mean, uh, for instance, they could not 
make an astronomical observatory of the sophistication of Hubble or Chandra. Uh, they don't even try. I mean, it's, it's way beyond their capability as far as guidance, as far as uh, accuracy, as far as high-tech, high tra uh, data transmission and so forth. They're, they're, at least that was my experience. I don't know of... Uh, ESA is quite comparable to, to NASA in uh, sophistication and so forth. Uh, not any more effective uh, as far as uh, overruns and all of that. Um, so, I, I, but I think that if you wanted to enter space uh, research, for instance, I would think that a, a model like ISIS would be most appropriate for you uh, because it maximizes scientific returns with reasonably uh, modest investment, okay? That, now I don't know what other, well, I, I'll stop here, I mean, otherwise I don't. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I, I like the way you you <coughs> define typical uh, large project, and I, in, in Thai, I must say the typical Hubble or Chandra or Alma, it's huge. You talk about ten to the nine dollars, which mm -hmm. is uh, a billion a billion U.S. dollar. That mm -hmm. would translate to about more than our total 10-year budget of NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. And NASDAQ has, at the moment, five national centers within NASDAQ. Uh, we, you talk about the project having about 1,000 people. That's about what we have. Uh, we have more than 1,000 people. We've been here 10 years. So, so your typical project is is the whole complex here, and, 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 and uh, Ajahn Sipanon mentioned that uh, building this can be considered a mega project. It's just, just about the right side for you. So, so with that reference of uh, the size of the investment of size and the S&T in the country, you, you care to, to, to uh, uh, comment a little bit on how a country such as developing countries in general should deal with uh, uh, this sort of uh, mega size project investment? Well, um, I do not know what fraction of your gross national product the money you mentioned represents. If it represents much less than 1%, then uh, you are not going to be very successful. That is, unless you are, you are brighter by factors of 10 than anybody else, then, I mean, uh, the normal kind of expenditure that one would expect, for example, Japan is 3% of gross national product. Oh, it's Two, about a quarter. A quarter, a quarter of a percent. Well, so the first thing I would tell you is, uh, you know, that, 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 that uh, I would certainly not suggest you start putting up a space station. I mean, uh, right? Uh, that would be ridiculous. On the other hand, I think that uh, assuming that your uh, that this research investment should grow, then I think that uh, the only uh, policy that I could expect is one that is not going to be terribly popular. I mean, among my colleagues, I, I would say which is concentration on um, specific items. That is, you have to choose something in which you will excel. Uh, to do everything halfway is not worth it. And so, uh, and, and you can define big program, big program, whatever you wish. I mean, you know, a big program could be 100 million, or it could be whatever. Uh, you can build a huge telescope or large telescope for, for, for maybe 300 million, or they are trying to do that in California. I, I think you can compare what you do to the state of California, I suppose, or, or the state of Massachusetts or Maryland, because that's kind of the size of thing. And there are universities there who try to work independently of the government and through private funding and, and do certain things. And by concentrating on specific items, they uh, have succeeded in doing very well in some areas. Once you get above a certain level, 
it's beyond the private means to, to so even, uh, you know, the, the state of California with uh, Caltech cannot compete with the European Union put together. That's why the very large telescope is better than Keck. I mean, but so it would be concentration and so forth. I, I think, however, there would be some uh, criteria that I think are basic here. And uh, how can I? Okay, merit, meritocracy, accountability, review, external review, uh, reference to, uh, to promises and following with management, information system, and so forth. So those are kind of basics because they, they, they create a, a kind of an honest playing field and competitiveness. I mean, when we say, I mean, you know, I don't know what, the, what you are great at, but I would imagine that the funding agency can really stimulate competition, not just distribute the money uniformly, but stimulate competition and uh, put in more money in those things that appear most promising and a bit, little bit less maintaining other things which are necessary for education or whatever. So I would, if you are small, then you can't afford to disp spread your energies, is all I'm trying to say. But the principles for management are not, not different. In fact, I, uh, if I may, I'm sorry, I'm abusing my, my time, but um, in fact, you should start with small projects. Because it is only in doing the small project that people that can allow young people to fail, right? You do a project, it fails, well, that's too bad, but some other will succeed. That's how you train them to become managers for larger and larger and larger projects. So, in fact, the, the idea of starting with small projects and then moving up is for the future may give you better returns than, uh, than uh, going into mega investments right off the bat. I don't know, you may disagree with it. Uh, to follow up on Dr. Sakharin's question, uh, how did this kind of project get started? Uh, I mean, I presumably it's not that some enlightened politician coming to you and say, let's build a telescope. No. Uh, how do you uh, convince them? How do you sell the projects uh, with the uh, uh, who's it? Uh, do you, uh, did you do this and so on? Dr. Dr. Piyawat is the director of Thailand Research Fund, by the way. Um, we were lucky in the United States for quite a while because we had a number of uh, funding agencies. For instance, I went to NASA to ask to get money to look for X-ray stars, and they turned me down because there were no X-ray stars. So I went to the Air Force saying, would you like me to look at x-rays? Maybe the moon, maybe you are interested in that. Why not? Uh, and so I could go on doing what I wanted to do. This was very small. So at the time, there was money around, and uh, it was easier to get support. Now, as you get to bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, then uh, you need the support of your colleagues. Okay, And the support of your colleagues it's actually, you know, at, at the beginning you think uh, it can't be, right? Because everybody's going to pull for his own thing. But it's not true. So we, uh, in astronomy, for instance, and this is being quoted often in the United States as an as a, as a example of how disciplines should try to come to conclusions. We have, every 10 years, we have a, um, a study which is uh, organized by the National Academy of Sciences. And this study will have the result, first of all, it's done in consultation with most astronomers, that is, every astronomer in the, in the country, maybe 6,000 of them are allowed to, to say something. The result of that study is a set of prioritized uh, uh, programs in which the community, after much fighting and uh, back and forth, has finally agreed to. This gives tremendous strength to the to the program, and then uh, it's passed along to the funding agencies, be NASA or NSF or whatever, you, who uh, typically the only reaction they have is too much money, right? I mean, it's, uh, that's, uh, 
And however, it is prioritized so that to the extent that that is done, that represents the, 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 the will or the desire of the community. And as an individual, so your job is to convince your colleagues that you know what you're doing and that it's worthwhile to support and so forth. Uh, that was uh, one of my main jobs as a young man, uh, to try to convince people, for instance, to fly X-ray telescopes because they were distinguished uh, um, theoretical astrophysicists who said there was no point. Right? So that you have, and you keep going, right? You keep trying to explain it, and, and on and on and on. And uh, finally, uh, it got through. So it's, it's, it's very much a, a individual push uh, that, that uh, I mean, you don't do it alone, you know, but, but, but you, you spend your life doing that. First question on your best practice or suggestion on 7 to the M level, number of staff yeah. versus the level. Yes. Uh, why do we need to believe in the 7? Why 2, oh. 6, or 5, or 8, um, who, who <laughs> say 7? I, I just have found that more than 7 I can't talk to. I mean, there are 7 days in the week, and even counting no vacations, <laughs> I can only talk to one person, you know. It's a, there is no justification. You could do 10 to the M. The, the point, though, the important point that I don't want to miss in the joke is the following, that uh, if that number becomes much smaller than seven, what you have is an infinite long uh, list of people, chain of people, one with two and two and two. I mean, take two to the exponential, etc. Now you have multiplied levels by the square, right? I mean, or something. Uh, that is a very uh, bureaucratic, uh, unmoving organization. I mean, because nobody, no group of two people can have a responsibility to do a major job, right? Uh, so there's no way to manage it and all of that. So I think, <laughs> if anything, I would say, so organizations are mostly like this in pyramidal structure, and I'm saying they should be like this. That's all I'm saying qualitatively particularly technical organization. I mean, everybody who has developed software knows that the most agile groups are seven people, roughly speaking. And uh, they all talk to each other, they eat pizza on the computers together, they do all of that. And those are the guys, the most productive guys you can have around. So. If I may have another question without any objections. Uh, through your slides, that's one key important issue that the visions and the knowledge involved in the project should be transferred to all level of management. Um, let's say if, if we are the person who keeps the visions that flow, uh, what, uh, how can you tell that down to the, to the bottom level they understand the same visions? Uh, for example, I only have two level of management for my groups, for 30 people, and I thought I do my job well. I say what I, I say what I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I found out about six months later that they don't. <laughs> I mean, how how can you detect that in the early stage before you actually proceed? Well, I mean, if you if you wait six months, all, all I was saying was frequent review. I said reviews on a monthly basis. So it's your problem if you d waited six months. It means you have too many people reporting to you, you see? So you can only see them once every six months. Uh, <laughs> but I would say that, that if you delegated, that is at, at, and so you should have this level, have given the responsibility, and you should have the next la layer under you worry about that. But uh, I think this idea of sharing vision is, is important. Um, when I arrived at uh, ESO in Europe, this, uh, this observatory, uh, I found out that there were all of these groups working on the same project, but they had never met. So we organized and we made it a tradition that every year we would dedicate a week 
in which everybody from the top to the bottom of the organization, I will come in and say, my goals last year were to do this and this. I have accomplished this and I failed on the other ones and I'll try to do better next year and here's what I will change, etc. Everybody was supposed to answer, to, to report, not uh, 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 to the infinite low level, but to report. And everybody was sitting around, or was free to know what everybody was doing. It turned out very, very effectively. Uh, you can choose other ways. I mean, it's, uh, I chose that one because I was impatient. I mean, I couldn't really educate the lower level manager to be good communicators. We didn't have the time. Last question, I promise. <laughs> Um, given a uh, large, uh, that's large, uh, moderately, moderately large size project, <coughs> or mega project, let's say that project doesn't have problem with political support or everybody agree with. But do you, but in the past, the example that size of mega projects sometimes do. From the, your experience, is there any way that you can detect whether that mega project is highly potentially doomed or highly potentially successful? Well, uh, Star Wars was doomed from the beginning because of the stupidity of the ideas that were going into it. So you didn't need to be a manager to know it wouldn't work. Yet, we, we spent billions on that. Uh, because nobody had the courage uh, to say, Mr. President, uh, you know, this is stupid. Uh, or maybe they did, and maybe there was other reasons which I don't, I'm not aware of. Maybe they, uh, maybe uh, Reagan wanted to spend the, uh, the USSR at the time into the ground, right, in trying to defend against something that didn't make any sense. Right? So I don't know. But I think wrong vision or something really basic wrong or unachievable is a, the project cannot succeed. Uh, I think the rest is, I think there are good enough management systems that you can detect early failure. Uh, a typical one is the project is delayed by, I mean, typical thing that happens is you get in a project and you find out it's delayed by a year per year. Every year, it's the same goal, but displaced one year. So you never, you never make it because, okay. And, you know, I, I got involved in projects which were like that. And so the first thing was to reduce the, the, the derivative. I mean, uh, so the rate, uh, you had to gain or, or rather than lose. And I, I think you, I don't think it's, it's knowledge I, I think we have the means to, to, to detect potential failure, is that the reluctance to act is what... Okay? Yes. Uh, Professor, uh, well, I'm very much impressed of your outline of how to manage to make a project here. but. In Thailand, we have to face reality. Some of these outlines that you suggested to us cannot be implemented. Mention so, one or uh, two. So, so, so I uh, suppose in organizational program, maybe it's, it's not possible to follow all the steps that you, you, you suggest. But my interest is that, uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, suppose that we can a project is initiated by the government, and we have operated under the government bureaucracy, no other way. Okay, and under the government, the, the, uh, uh, government bureaucracy, there's also different steps. Certain steps must be followed. It's already a bureaucratic process in, in itself. Uh, and you're suggesting that the best management should be flat, pyramid. Yes. Yeah. So suppose it could not be flat. For 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 practical reason, it could not be flat. What but would I, be the way that you would suggest that we 
mitigate, we, 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 we make corrective measures on that. So that to make sure the project progresses in in good pace. Thank you. I am. Um, I, I need to ask you this uh, clarification. I am talking of a flat organization from the manager or the director of the project down. In a sense, I'm not considering the organization above, that is, the organization of the entity which gives the funding. It, it, I have as abstracted from that. I assume there is a single person interface, suppose. Okay. So I'm saying that from the point of view of the funding agency, I have nothing to say. I mean, I, unless this very, uh, in fact, for the, for the funding agency, I would prefer a very narrow pyramid because by having a very large pyramid, you create a number of points of contacts which are incredibly time wasteful because now all of, you have to inform all of these different people about what's going on. Whereas having a single point of contact is preferable. I mean, or, or not single, but single group or whatever. In that sense, I found it much easier to work with generals, for instance, in the, in the Department of Defense than working with scientific organization because the scientific norm organization normally try to tell you how to do the job. Whereas the general just give you the job and say, go do it. Uh, that's easier. Uh, so, but I am talking a flat organization below that. Uh, okay. So that, that's what I mean. Below that, yeah. at the implementing level. Now, uh, if you cannot do that at the implementing level, then I, uh, well, I mean, we have work, I, you know, the, we all have worked with organizations with five, six, seven levels. Uh, it gets difficult. The people at the bottom uh, 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 in such an organization normally don't know what's going on, and they don't care. That's the point. They do not care. And so you're spending tremendous, you, you are, uh, you're paying for a lot of inefficiency because they don't care. They are not part of the success. They, they, they don't have a stake. They don't own the project. So ownership in the project, is, as we say, is terribly important. And you can do that more quick, better if it is a flat organization. That's all. But again, it's, there isn't only one way to... Okay. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, may, may I uh, ask you to seek your, your opinion on this, that uh, um, the objective of this, this project is, is to have a successful implementation and of course you increase the ownership of, of the, the, those yes. who are working for the project. Now suppose we cannot have a flat organization as much as we would like to. Would that mean that the manager would himself or herself will have to work harder in terms of communication through the line uh, of command. Uh, would that have some any interrelationship to that uh, communication and fat management? Thank you. Well, uh, um, it, it uh, communication, the ability to communicate seems to go inversely with the level. Uh, and so if you have to, uh, to uh, send to management school uh, a certain number of people at a certain level, you can do that. And in fact, you are training a management cadre that will know the proper practices. I mean, uh, hopefully, I mean, the, the, the aim of all this exercise is that you as a manager don't want to control. You want to let people do their work and once in a while find out what they are doing. I mean, because presumably they know what they are doing better than you do because otherwise you shouldn't have them there. Now, if you try to now manage to pass this knowledge down too deeply, it gets harder and harder. Now you've got to train, you know, 
I, I mean, if you have 300 people, you have to train all 300 to, to, to be skilled communicators. I, I, many of us, I think, can think of colleagues that are not capable of speaking to their own students. I mean, uh, you know, that's... Uh, okay. So, I think there are advantages. Um, the, the thing that I would think would be most difficult, at least in my experience in Italy, was meritocracy is a bad word in Italy. And uh, I don't know if it is a good word or a bad word in, uh, in Thailand. Um, but this idea, for instance, of, uh, of yearly uh, evaluation, uh, that creates b big problems. And let me, let me try to spend some words, because this is an important point, I think. You put together a research institution, which is funded by public funds. And presumably, it is set up to, do, to achieve certain objectives. It's not set up to allow the scientists in that institution to do their own thing, to do, to play their own whatever research they want. I think that, so, so what we try to do, but since we must have scientists which are active researchers in this kind of things, we say, all right, you can have half of your time for research, but half you must serve, okay? And so the idea that everybody in the organization is responsible to serve, which means to achieve the organizational objectives, which have been created by the government, means that you're not entirely free, just like a teacher in a university has obligation to do not only research but teaching, so these people have the obligation to operate facilities, to create things or whatever. Uh, that gets lost sometimes. In, uh, so the scientists, you know, they, they, they in fact do not share the vision of the organization, do not share the responsibility to carrying out the work. They become, you know, uh, separated from the, their very reason for existence. And uh, th this has, has occurred. I mean, in, particularly in old organizations, this is true. One of the advantages you have is that you're creating everything anew, so you have the chance to do it right. <clears throat> to follow up on your explanation, uh, <clears throat> could you paint uh, uh, picture of how the staff work uh, starting from the organization structure. Is this uh, one organization dedicated to building the telescope, for example, or does the organization have uh, several other uh, mandates? Uh, also, uh, That's a, well, how, yeah. how, how hard do you work the staff, uh, what, what kind of normal lives do they have? Uh, are there a lot of turnovers? Uh, I, I didn't understand uh, this last point. Uh, are, there a last, uh, are there a lot of turnovers uh, during the 10 years of the project? Turnovers, uh, you yes. said? Staff oh. moving in and out. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this a, sort of a special period in their working life, or are they expected to, to work uh, in this kind of uh, mega project from one to another? Okay. Something like I, that. I think the answer is yes uh, to the last point. That is, they expect to go from one to the other, but maybe in the same institution. For instance, the people who have been working on the Space Telescope Science Institute, which was an operational entity for the Hubble telescope, have now been given the responsibility to operate the next uh, large telescope, which is uh, the James Webb telescope, which is currently being built by NASA. So that's, there is a certain continuity. They are involved in the design, they are involved in the operations, and so forth. Uh, maybe closer to what you are saying is, um, is uh, the, the, what was happening in ESO, uh, where uh, not only were we building this one um, large telescope, but we were operating simultaneously two other observatories. And the same was true for ALMA, which was being carried out by this uh, National uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory, where we, uh, this ALMA project was being built 
but also there was a Socorro, an array in Socorro, an array distributed around the world, another observatory up in uh, Green Bank, and so forth. The, um, when an organization, an existing organization, tries to carry out a project which is you know, larger than, say, the yearly budget of the organization, then you have problems. I mean, you uh, actually are putting strain in the organization. However, that, can, that could be turned to good effect because in order to carry out this large project, you must reorganize the whole place. This then leaves, it doesn't mean, uh, and so for instance, while building the, the very large telescope, <coughs> we use the current observatories as test beds for, uh, for new, um, new software, command system, and basically the idea was that the whole observatory would participate, even the ones who didn't have direct responsibility of the project, and benefit in an overall improvement of quality of all of that we were doing. And one of the things, by the way, that, that was being done while we were doing that, I closed seven out of 15 telescopes because they were second rate, they were not producing at the level of excellence which we were establishing to ourselves. So that has brought a renewal, that brings around a renewal of the organization, if you are successful, as a whole. It is not, however, I mean, it is not an academic institution, it's not a, a broad based research institution in which you do astronomy, you do engineering, you do, this was a very focused uh, effort by the European organization to achieve leadership in uh, optical ground-based astronomy, to achieve parity in radio astronomy, which is the next project, and the, uh, achieve supremacy in uh, the next telescope project, which will be maybe 25 years down the stream, to build a 100-meter uh, diameter telescope on the ground. So it, it was a very concerted, if you wish, long-term planning effort with mm -hmm with goals that uh, would be progressively achieved. Dr. Kopp. Dr. Kopp, please. My name is Kopp, <coughs> Kritya Kiranat, uh, board member and advisor of uh, NASDA. Uh, I'd like to continue this discussion of the focused projects and unfocused projects. Uh, I think that uh, many people in Thailand, when we hear about uh, focused projects like going to the moon or going to the Mars, we feel very envious because the projects look so clear in the scope and the target and so on. Whereas uh, I think that most of us in Thailand have to struggle with this rather unfocused projects like Dr. Sakharin's trying to build up the science park and so on. But uh, the unfocused projects like building up Science Park can uh, consist of a number, a series of focused projects like, yes. okay, we can try to build a workable fuel cell or solar cell or the uh, IC wafer fabrication process and so on. Uh, my question is this, uh, can you give some uh, wise words on, say, how to try to uh, define or choose some workable, appropriate target or goal for the project? Uh, I think we have difficulties in doing that, in choosing or in defining a project or define their goals, appropriate goals. And a consequential question is that uh, assuming some kind of goals can be identified or uh, defined, uh, how, how, how do we uh, test and uh, uh, present the feasibility of the projects? 
And finally, in selling the feasibility to say the political process, the decision process in giving the financial resources for it. So there are two questions. How to uh, choose and define workable goals and targets and how to test and present the feasibility of those projects. Uh, I, 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 at this point, I should comment, right, that having the Nobel Prize for doing X-ray astronomy doesn't make me a savant or a wise man. I mean, you know. Uh, so I fully recognize my limitations in answering to you, and uh, it is in all modesty that I offer what, uh, what I can. Um, I, one way in which it worked, at least that I observed, was that in the beginning it's important to have a fairly broad uh, support of things. Uh, small grants, uh, I, I would define a small grants of like 100,000 or below uh, dollars. Um, small groups, typically university-based or maybe even corporate, uh, in a private corporation, they come up with ideas and, uh, and things and, uh, which, in which the, the characteristic is there is some young person, some young man that uh, thinks he knows it all and, and uh, he is selected competitively and given a chance to succeed or fail. Now, if you uh, have, uh, so basically that would reflect what education you have had here or what interests have been developed in the country among these young scientists. To start without that, I mean, it would be very difficult. I mean, you can impose whatever you want, but if there is nobody interested in doing it, I mean, you have problems, right? I mean. Uh, so I would try to give the opportunity for ideas to emerge and also this to be used as a training ground and then to have tough competitions in areas in which you think you can achieve excellence. So I, I would say as a basic criteria, I don't think it matters what you start doing provided you do it very well. Um, I mean, if you play useless games like golf, you better do it very well. <laughs> no, it's very important because if you, if you accept mediocrity, then you will be condemned to mediocrity forever. But if you aim to excellence, and you might achieve it in some places, okay? Then it becomes self, uh, self propagating this thing because then success would point the way in areas, nanotechnology, I don't, you know, there could be a brilliant young man that is, uh, comes up. All I am saying is if you try to impose it from the above, that is hard. So you are much better off in, in trying to, to, uh, to go on your strength, which is the young people who are interested in doing something. That's the strength. I, I, okay, that, that would be my approach. So you can't do it all in one day. Dr. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. And I think, I think all of this through competition. I mean, there is no question in my mind, because otherwise it's... Dr. Okay, Iti, please. Yes. Uh, um, I may raise uh, our experience in Thailand, uh, and maybe you can comment uh, or advise. Uh, from uh, my experience in Thailand, when we propose a project greater than one billion baht, which is about 40 million, uh, uh, about 25 million US. It's become extremely difficult to get approval because uh, it's a kind of uh, a sensational barrier, emotional barrier of the budget uh, funding agency uh, when we uh, break through 1 billion baht or 25 million US. So uh, our challenge uh, for our generations is we try to get people used to these figures, 25 million.